most casual of comic book readers have heard the title Watchmen. This classic graphic novel is heralded as not just one of the greatest comic books of all time, but a great piece of literature. It's written by Alan Moore and illustrated by Dave Gibbons. Originally, it was an original tale that was to focus on the characters that DC Comics had just purchased from Charlton Comics. DC decided to instead fold those new characters into their existing superhero universe with their Crisis on Infinite Earths storyline. Moore instead created brand new characters for the story. Moore would tell a story that satirized the superhero genre, while at the same time examining the fears and governmental perplexities of the modern day, then 1985. The artwork by Dave Gibbons would not only capture the story in gritty detail, but if looked at as a whole, was a tapestry of moody images that encapsulated the time period. His layouts would mirror each other from issue to issue, so you could see how the art would fold back into itself, just as Dr. Manhattan would see time and space. Studios would quickly snatch up the film rights. But after many starts and stops, it was deemed unfilmable by filmmaker Terry Gilliam. That didn't stop anyone from trying. In 1986, Lawrence Gordon and Joel Silver bought the rights for the property with plans to make it at 20th Century Fox. The studio contacted Alan Moore about writing the screenplay for the film. <laughs> Anyone that knows Moore's attitude towards adaptations of his work can guess how that went. He immediately turned them down. And they then turned to Sam Hamm. When he took over, he decided to change up some of the aspects of the story and make the ending more manageable. In the Ham draft, the team of superheroes is known as the Watchmen. In 1976, they fail to stop a terrorist group from blowing up the Statue of Liberty, and the Keen Act is created by the U.S. government to outlaw vigilantes. It then jumps ahead 10 years with news of Edward Blake's murder. Rorschach begins to investigate as Dan and Lori begin a relationship. Dr. Manhattan exiles himself to Mars. Everything finally culminates at Adrian Veidt's Antarctic base. Here, he reveals he was behind everything that has happened to the group. He plans on time traveling back to the 60s to prevent Dr. Manhattan from ever being created. His reasoning is that it will drastically change the course of history for the better. When he attempts to use his machines to make this jump, it vaporizes him. Realizing he's right, Manhattan uses his powers to travel back and prevent himself from going into the experiment that created him. History has changed, but Rorschach, Dan, and Lori are transported to this new reality. They see that the Watchmen story is just a comic book now, and superheroes don't exist, placing them in our reality. Fox put the movie in turnaround in 1991, and it moved over to Warner Brothers, where Terry Gilliam was brought on to direct the film. He wasn't a fan of Ham's script, so he brought on his frequent collaborator, Charles McEwen, to rewrite it. They added back in a lot of the elements from the comics that Ham had taken out. Most notably, the film was narrated by Rorschach's journal, as the comic book had been. As they were trying to raise money for the film, they started the casting process. One actor that Joel Silver really wanted on the project was Arnold Schwarzenegger to play Dr. Manhattan. He was at the peak of his popularity at the time, and he hoped it would bring in audiences. Having him as the centerpiece of the whole plot doesn't seem like it would have lent itself to Schwarzenegger's strengths, but he at least would have had the body for it. The role of Rorschach had perhaps the most interesting casting, as two people seemed to be vying for the part. One report from Entertainment Weekly's oral history of The Watchmen stated that Robin Williams wanted the part. With the hindsight of Williams' dark characters in Insomnia and One Hour Photo, this is not actually a surprise. He could have brought real darkness to the role that probably would have floored everyone. Later in an interview with BBC, Alan Moore said that he had talked with Terry Gilliam while he was in pre-production on the film. Gilliam had stated that he had numerous of conversations with David Bowie. He had been clamoring to play the part of Rorschach in the film, a performance we can only dream about. Warner Brothers began to have cold feet on the project after both Gilliam and Silver had gone over budget on their previous films. The duo said they needed at least $100 million to make this film a reality. The Warner Brothers only offered up $25 million for the film, and Silver had to look around for more money. It would never come. Without the budget, the film would once again go into turnaround. It might be surprising to hear, but Gilliam was relieved. He claimed that in order to get everything you needed out of Watchmen, it would need to be a five-part miniseries. 
When Mikion and himself were trying to condense down the 12 issue comic series, they realized that to squeeze that much story into a two hour movie would be impossible. He claimed the property was unfilmable. The movie once again moved over to Universal Pictures, where the producers found David Hayter. Coming off the first X-Men movie, they figured he knew his comic book stuff and offered him the writing and directing job in 2001. Hayter was a big comic book fan. He loved Watchmen and called Alan Moore to let him know how much he loved the comics and how much he respected Moore as a writer. Hayter told him that he could be as involved or not involved as he wanted to be. Moore appreciated this approach and told him that this was his story and to do with it what he wanted. Hayter said that he would keep in touch with Moore throughout the whole process and would ask him questions. His first draft would come in at over 300 pages. In this script, he moved the timeline for the whole story forward. Edward Blake, the comedian, began his superhero antics in the last days of Vietnam, but was now in the Second Gulf War. He was doing the same brutal things from the comics, but now in a new setting. Any conflicts that were mentioned connected to Russia in the comics were changed to Middle Eastern terrorism. Hayter also gave Silk Spectre powers with the ability to shoot light out of her hands. After Hayter came on board, there seemed to instantly be problems with Universal. Some of the notes he said he got from them were, there are too many characters. Can't we just have two and make it a buddy superhero type of movie? We don't understand the blue guy. Why is everything so dark? They all knew the project was in trouble, so they left Universal and wanted to head over to Revolution Studios. Hayter set up a potential cast list for the film that included Denzel Washington as Dr. Manhattan, John Cusack as Dan Dreisberg, and Daniel Craig as Rorschach. He would go on to shoot a proof of concept piece to show the idea for the film. In it, he played out the scene where Rorschach comes to Dan's apartment to tell him about Blake's murder. In the piece, he had Ian Glenn of Game of Thrones and Titans fame to play Night Owl and Ray Stevenson to play Rorschach. It was supposed to be Daniel Craig, but at the last minute he dropped out saying he just wasn't feeling it. Hayter pushed the shoot off for a week and wound up casting Stevenson. The piece is a little more staged than hopefully would have been in the film, but you can see what he is going for. A little more noir, while still being less dark than the film would end up getting. The deal with Revolution Studios would fall apart, and they would once again move to a new studio. This time, at Paramount, they thought Darren Aronofsky would be a great director to have on the property. He said sure, but he was leaving to make The Fountain and would be tied up with that for a long time. Aronofsky was on the movie for a week, but most news outlets reported it as a done deal. He had said in recent interviews that he wished he could have got his name taken off the discussion of Watchmen as he didn't even have a chance to do anything with the film. In 2004, Paul Greengrass would be brought on to the film fresh off the Born supremacy. He jumped into the movie and sets were being made at the famous Pinewood Studios. Fans were excited to see what kind of elements he would bring from his action films to Watchmen. Sadly, they never got to find out the film was once again put into turnaround, and it left Paramount. In an interview later, Greengrass explained that they had fallen afoul of the dreaded regime change at Paramount. He felt that they were on their way to make the film, and then suddenly they weren't. Everything just seemed to stop out of nowhere. He explained his take on the film, and it might have left fans wondering what had happened to their favorite comic if it had gone through. In 2021, he compared his version of the film to Todd Phillips' Joker, he stated he didn't want to make a faithful adaptation of the comic. What he wanted to do was explore the characters as real people set in the real world. The superhero aspect of it would have just been in these people's minds. He mentions the Jack Nicholson film One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest as an inspiration for this film. These were real people living in the real world, but their ideas about themselves and how they perceived themselves were all in their heads. He even says that Christopher Nolan ended up doing such a thing much better than he would have in the Batman trilogy. He grounded the film in the real world, but set out to show how a person's delusions could come into reality. How they think of themselves could affect the real world around them. His production designer, Dominic Watkins, talked about the conversations they had about the world the film was set in. He mentioned that the movie would have been modernized, and that we were still in the dark period that the comics represented in their story. Coming out of the Bush era could lend itself to the themes and tones from the original comic while still speaking to the current culture. After leaving Paramount, the film once again ended up back at Warner Brothers. This time, Zack Snyder would be attached to the film when Warner Brothers were impressed with his work on 300. 
he agreed to take the project and said he was doing it to protect it from the Terry Gilliams of the world. Ouch. He would make the film as close to the comic as he could make it. The biggest change to the story was the ending, swapping out the giant tentacle alien and instead putting in a bomb explosion that gets blamed on Dr. Manhattan. Warner Brothers not only let him adapt as close as possible, but also ramped up the advertising for the film. This caused a high demand for the collected version of the comic. Over one million copies had to be printed to meet this demand. On home video, Warner Brothers even allowed a version of the movie called The Ultimate Cut to be released. This version takes the director's cut of the film, which is just over three hours long, and combines the animated film The Black Freighter into this film. This makes it even closer to the comic, as a kid is reading a pirate comic that has story beats and themes that blend into what the issue's story was. This comic is a classic. It took a long time and a lot of drafts to make it to the big screen, but it did finally land. Whether it's a good adaptation or not is up to the viewer, but at least we always have the classic comic to fall back on. <laughs> 